Good morning, everybody. Uh, let's pray and get started, and then Matt's going to bring the announcements. Father, we thank you for your love, Lord, and we just thank you for the lesson this morning. Lord, you just ask you, Lord, to help us all to, to just learn your word, Father, and be the, the, the Christians that we need to be, Father, out in the world. And, Lord, I just thank you for Brother Mike. Lord, just uh, ask that you, Lord, just be with him, Father, as he leads our church. Uh, Lord, we just uh, ask you to be with Brother Waylon this morning as he leads our song service. Just prepare our hearts and get us ready for your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I'm not Matt. Amen. <laughs> Matt's been on sabbatical. I told him this morning, I said he's used all his vacation time. He's used all his sick time, <laughs> comp time. Now he says he's been on sabbatical. Bless his heart. All right, but we sure glad he and Miss Alta's back, especially Miss Alta. But anyway, uh, we do want to just announce a couple things today. Uh, as we get the week going on here tonight, I'll come back to this morning, but tonight, just kind of last moment thing. Several of you mentioned to me about us getting together, maybe showing the movie here or something, but the one about the Robinson family, The Blind, if, we, if you would like to go see that, I got the theaters to do a special presentation of that tonight at 530. They're going to put it in a theater, a lot of it primarily, because I told them I thought we'd have a pretty good group would like to come see it. So there's going to be a special showing of that tonight uh, at 530. I know some folks told me they have seen it, said it was a really good movie. And uh, so if you'd like to go, you need to get there probably about five just to make sure, because it could start to fill up and not have room for all of us to get in there but uh, at Tinseltown tonight at 5.30, if you'd like to go. The cost is, I think, $11, $11.50, something like that, if you want to go. So, uh, but it's called The Blind. It's about the Robinson family and goes back to their history about how Phil got saved and all that and how rough his life was prior to that. So uh, we'll do that tonight. Tomorrow night is a special night. You won't want to forget uh, we have Dr. Richard Blackaby going to be with us. We've been really promoting that heavy. Uh, if you don't know Richard, his, he and his dad, prom prominently, I guess his dad, did more of it back years ago, did the Experiencing God series, and then there was one that followed that. I forget the title of it. But um, they've written together, written a lot of things together, and uh, really uh, maybe one of the most prominent folks that's been in our area in some time that we're going to get to hear tomorrow night. If you're a teacher, he's going to meet with the teachers and our leadership tomorrow night at, at 5 o'clock for a supper. And he's going to speak to the teachers about how to convey the Word of God, how to really reach people. And so we're going to talk to him tomorrow night about that at 5. But then the main service will be in here at 6. It's 30, not 6, 630. And he's going to be speaking in here to us and some other. We've invited all the churches, if any others want to come and be a part of that, at 6.30 tomorrow night. One other thing this week, Tuesday is supposed to be the day that they pick up the food for the Louisiana Baptist Children's Home. We have boxes here uh, in the four, over in the fellowship hall. I don't remember if we got one put out here or not, but we definitely have one in the fellowship hall. If you'd like to bring some non-perishable items for the Baptist Children's Home, you can bring those today, tomorrow, whenever, and uh, we'll make sure they pick those up. Uh, now, for this morning, welcome to the 40th anniversary of Washtenaw Baptist Church. Started in 1983 here. They bought this land and began uh, meeting out in this area, uh, a ministry uh, some, some folks from some different churches, the association got together and decided to plant a church in this area. I remember when that happened, and uh, what a blessing that was. So this morning, in honor of our 40th anniversary, we brought our area missionary, our associational missionary, Brother Stephen Kelly and his wife, Tammy Lee, and they're here with us this morning. We're honored to have them with us. But this guy's a great guy. I really am excited about what God's going to do with him in our association and so he's going to speak this morning they're going to sing in a little while and so we're looking forward to the day but let's just come together and celebrate the meal afterwards celebrate our 40 years of this being a part 
of, of, of the beginning of a church. It actually didn't become a church till a few years after that. If you don't know how that works, they kind of meet in, under a, another church. They were part, we were part of McClendon Baptist Church for a while. A number of our folks came from McClendon uh, out here to help plant this church. Brother Ray Anding was one of those. Uh, and who else was a charter member here? Would our charter members stand? Let me see who you are. All right. That's what I'm talking about. All right, good. These folks were here 40 years ago, way back there. Thank y'all. You can be seated, but thank you so much for what you've done. We, the ministry we have today comes on the shoulders of these folks who sacrificed to be here to help plant a new church in this area. So we're excited about that. And again, stay today for the fellowship, the meal afterwards. A lot of good food back there has been prepared this morning. And thank you for being here on this Lord's Day as we celebrate a milestone in the history of Washtenaw Baptist Church. All right, let's stand together. Just love. 
sinners lost and lonely, Jesus blood.
Before we sing, let me just say a quick word. Um, I'm Stephen Kelly, my wife Tamma Lee. It is a pleasure to be here. Brother Mike, appreciate the invitation on this 40th anniversary. What a, what a blessing. When I, when I think back 40 years ago, I was finishing high school, just started college. And so, uh, you know, that's, that's quite a legacy, 40 years. And today we're going to sing a song really about legacy. Um, my wife and I have uh, been married 36 years, and we met in 1986 
just north of San Francisco, California, doing summer missions. Um, I'm from the New Orleans area originally, grew up in Chalmette, spent the first half of my life there. My wife's from East Texas, Henderson, Texas, just south of Longview, if you know that area. And uh, within a few days of meeting, we, we served together for 10 weeks in the northern Bay Area of San Francisco in that summer. And we sang this song the first week we met and have sung it ever since. And so we thank God. It's a legacy thing. And so legacy is great to celebrate. And this song has great meaning. It's entitled More Than Wonderful. He promised us that he would be a counselor, a mighty God and a prince of peace. He promised us that he would be a father and would love us with a love that would not see. Well, I tried him, and I found his promises are true. He's everything he said that he would be. The finest words I know could not begin to tell. Oh, just how much Jesus really means. To me, for he is more wonderful than my mind can conceive. He's more wonderful than my heart can believe. He goes beyond my highest hope. to think the King of glory would come to live within the hearts of man. I marvel just to know He really loves me when I think of who He is and who I am.
everything that he promised and so much more he's more than amazing yes that's what jesus is that's what my savior is to me And there we go. Well, folks, thank you for having us today. A pleasure to sing. Um, my wife was a vocal performance major in college and uh, sang all over the place. And in fact, I need to tell you a quick story. This is, this is a great story. Um, we were looking at getting married. Uh, like I mentioned, we met, met in California. We visited back and forth long distances uh, from me being in Chalmette, my hometown, to her being in Henderson, Texas. And she had applied to be in the Continental Singers. And she made the Continental Singers. Way back then, I was very popular. And she was, a, was asked to be in the premier group that was going to tour Europe in the summer of 1987. And she said, no, I'm getting married. She chose me. What a blessing. <laughs> um, best decision she ever made. Um, no, just joking. But, um, you know, we made that decision and been married 36 years. I have three kids. We have a 33-year-old, uh, Andrew, uh, single. He needs a wife. If you know anybody, let me know. I um, have a 30-year-old, Adam. Adam is married and has our, our granddaughter, Trinity, who's three. And then our daughter, Sarah, will be 24 this coming week. And she's working on a master's at Louisiana Christian University, teaching in Pineville. And uh, she toured all over the state with the voices of Louisiana College for four years. And she's got a great voice, too, from her mother. And so what a blessing to uh, have our kids been in a ministry for um, 32 years pastoring, pastored in six places. Uh, we served in rural Mississippi near Macomb. We were church planters in the state of Iowa uh, for a couple of years, started a church in Ottumwa, Iowa. Uh, we served in the Baker for a while and then came to North Louisiana to Doyleen. That's where I met Waylon McCormick. His dad was on my search committee. And Waylon looks just like his dad, poor, poor boy. Um, I really loved his dad, Ray, and then uh, we served in, at First Baptist Manny for seven years, and then the last 13 were on the coast in Morgan City, where I was at uh, the best ministry we had, which was at the Bayou Vista Baptist Church, where I also served as director of missions for the last seven years on a part-time basis. So when this door opened, uh, God really spoke to me about putting my name in. I, I really didn't have coming to Monroe on my radar. It wasn't there. I could have retired on the coast, had a great church. But I said, okay, God, I will be obedient and put my name into the hat. And so I was called. Let me just tell you this before I get into the message. If you feel compelled to just be obedient to put your name in, God may call you. But Brother Steve, I don't want to go. It's not about what you want to do. It's what God tells you to do. And so, you know, as a church, if you've reached 40 years and God wants you to go beyond that, there's going to have to be some steps of faith taken to go the next 40 years. And so today I want to share a message. It wasn't really my plan to do this. And as I was praying this week about what to do, it's a message God gave to me after we got here to, to Monroe. And it's very personal. And, and here's what I've come to learn. You know, we always talk real churchy stuff. And we talk theology. And obviously we talk about salvation and redemption and fellowship with God and reading your Bible and praying and doing all the stuff we do in church. But here's what I realize, and your church has uh, the, the moniker, the, the healing place. Uh, there's a lot of churches with a lot of people who need a lot of healing that don't miss a Sunday. And what I'm talking about is deep embedded hurts and pains, unforgiveness, anger, and bitterness. And so today I want to share about a personal experience we had a few years ago and then I, I realized this, none of you had this experience, but you've had something like it. 
And as a result, you've got some hurts in your life. And some of you today need to release the hurts in your life. Some of you need today need to let go of some things. I'm not telling, saying you're lost. And maybe some of you are. You need to get saved. You came for homecoming because you were bothered by somebody to come. And you need to get right with God. Don't take that away. But I'm talking to the lion's share of folks here, here all the time. Because you have hurts in your life that you need to deal with, that you won't let go of. And as a result, you're chained to yesterday and you can't move forward. So today I want us to look at God's Word at Psalm 73. I'm going to be reading verses 1 through 3 and then 13 through 17. Let's honor God's Word by standing. I'll be reading out of the New King James Version this morning. Truly God is good to Israel, to such as are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled, my steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Verse 13, surely I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocence, for all day long I have been plagued and chastened every morning. If I had said, I will speak thus, behold, I would have been untrue to the generation of your children. When I thought how to understand this, it was too painful for me. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. Let's pray. God, I pray for the hurting man and woman here today. Uh, the person who had something happen this week or a year ago or 20 years ago, uh, that God is struggling with hurt. Hurt because somebody hurt them. Hurt because they're disappointed in God. Hurt because they just can't shake something that happened in the past for whatever reason. And today I pray for the hurting man and the hurting woman who needs to come home on homecoming and get right with their father. So speak to us today that we would know you in Jesus' name. Amen. You can go ahead and be seated. It was uh, June of 2018. We were serving Bayou Vista Baptist Church. Great, wonderful church on the coast. I praise God for that church. We're in the middle of Vacation Bible School. It's the first week of June 2018. And so it is Wednesday morning, getting ready for day three. We did morning VBS, and uh, my wife's phone rings at three in the morning. Now, your phone doesn't ring at three in the morning if it's good news normally. And so the phone rings at three in the morning, and it is my middle child, Adam, whose wife is pregnant with our first grandchild. And uh, the baby's not due for six weeks. Well, he calls and says, uh, we're at the hospital in Morgan City uh, area, I went to labor during the night. We're going to have the baby within the hour. So we did what we needed to do. We got dressed. We drove. It's like six miles to the hospital. We got there. and Within the hour, our, our first grandchild is born, Elijah Reuben Kelly, four pounds, 13 ounces, 18 inches in length. Everything looks good. In fact, uh, labor was very short consider considering, uh, you know, what it could have been. And there's no problems. He looks good. There's no issues. He's, his color's great. He's eating. And so uh, this is 3 in the morning. I'm, I'm actually very involved in Bible school. Tamalee's the director, but the assistant took over that day. I had to teach. I was teaching 5th and 6th grade. We had 150 kids in Bible school. It was a good-sized school. And, and so um, I got back, got back after Bible school that day, held, uh, saw my grandson uh, the next day, he took pictures with them. Everything's good. We get to Friday, and during the night, he goes into distress. And we're doing our last day of Bible school. We have a big, big program where generally 400 people show up for this thing. I mean, with the parents and grandparents, we fill the building. The kids do a big program. It's a big deal. And, and so uh, we had to go to Children's Hospital, Women in Children's Hospital in Lafayette, where they had airlifted Elijah. I'm thinking, he's just premature. This is all there is to it. And that afternoon, uh, my life changed uh, forever as a pediatric cardiologist meets with the family and says, um, Elijah has a very rare heart condition called hypoplastic left heart syndrome, which means his left ventricle was malformed or underformed. And he will have to have open heart surgery in the next week. We're going to airlift him to Children's Hospital in New Orleans. And while he's there, you know, they're going to basically reroute his entire circulatory system. This will be the first of three open heart surgeries that he will have over the course of the next three years. Would it be better if I got a handheld mic? Would that be fine? Why don't we do that? This one and uh, get rid of my lapel. 
Is that better? So let me tell you what happens, because this is the story. We go ahead, and a week later, Elijah has open-heart surgery to reroute his entire circulatory system because he's missing an important valve. He, he codes during surgery. The doctor says it's going to be okay. He'll make it through. And then the very next morning, he codes for 38 minutes. And so they're doing little chest compressions on a four-pound, 13-ounce little boy. And so after we come out of that, we meet with the doctor that next day. And he says, I do not think he will survive. Let me tell you the story without getting into all the messy details. He lives for 76 days. Up and down. Up and down. He got to the point where he looked incredibly great. And then infection set in and he got toxic. And then we were on the verge of losing him. And then they went in and cleaned him up, and he looked good again. Up and down. My wife spent the, almost the entire summer of 2018 at Children's Hospital, and I spent the better part of the summer back and forth between there and Morgan City, which was over an hour. And here's what I had to learn, because this is so important for some of you, because you didn't lose a grandson, but you lost something great in your own life. I, I had to come to this conclusion if it doesn't go the way I want it, how am I going to deal with this? If he dies, how am I going to deal with this? A dear friend of mine who's a hospice chaplain uh, talked to me early on. He said, Steve, he may not make it. What are you going to do? How are you going to serve as a pastor? What are you going to do to, to, to get through this? And so here's what I had to come to conclude. I started praying. I started seeking God. I cried a lot because here's what I knew. Not only were my three children watching me who were young and my church is watching me and I, I got to hold it together. I got to be faithful to God in the middle of a situation I did not want to be in. And here's what you just need to know. There's going to come a point in time in your life and in the life of a church that we've got to answer this question, do we really believe this stuff? I mean, you can have homecoming and you can go in the back and eat chicken and dressing and, and visit with friends and we can sing songs. But we sang a minute ago, it is well with my soul. Many of you know the story of Horatio Spafford losing his family and, you know, the shipwreck and all of that. And, and life is terrible, but it is well with my soul. And I, like I said, I pastored six places. Let me tell you what I found in, in six pastorates. You got a lot of people who don't miss church that have sour hearts and bitter spirits and unforgiveness. And I'm going to tell you one of the greatest issues I find in church that we never deal with. And, and God has used this message in some other places since we've been here. We got people in the church, listen to me, that are consciously or unconsciously mad at God. There are people in this room this morning, something went sour, and you are consciously, meaning you know it, are unconsciously mad at God. So how do we deal with that? I want to speak on the subject today, disappointed, discouraged, and disconnected. Because I just want to give you really a quick rundown of what the message is. Life will be full of disappointments, and if you don't deal with those disappointments, you will become a person who's weighed down with discouragement. And if you come weighed down with discouragement, you will disconnect from God and people. Church is full of people like that. Disappointment happened. They took on discouragement because they didn't deal with it. And they separated themselves from what was most important in life. And there's some of you in this room today. Let's look at that today from the book of Psalms, uh, Psalm 73. Number one, catch this. Disappointment is not optional. In this life, you will be disappointed. I don't care if you're saved or not. Disappointment's a universal problem. In fact, you could put it this way. Life is nothing more than disappointment management. The way you manage the disappointments in your life will determine everything about where you're headed. And some of you have dealt with it better than others. Now, let me tell you, I am very good at dealing with disappointment because I'm a New Orleans Saints fan. <laughs> Amen? Now, some of you LSU fans are not doing very well this morning. I mean, you're just not. Some of you didn't sleep well last night, and you woke up mad today. 
In fact, LSU losing last night affected some of you more than it should have. But, you know, I was raised in, I, I was as far from the Superdome as this building is from the mill. That's how close I, I lived from the Superdome. I went to a bunch of Saints games growing up with my dad. We'd, we went to the Saints-Falcons game every year. I remember the, when they, they wore the bags. I went to Tulane Stadium early on. I was there the year the Superdome opened when we were in Morgan City. We got to go to the game the year after they won the Super Bowl and watch them drop the banner on Thursday night. We got to go to all that. I, I love watching the Saints, but folks, they won the Super Bowl once. They lost a lot. You know, isn't that a picture of life? Every once in a while, you win the Super Bowl. But oftentimes, it's dealing with disappointment and dealing with discouragement. And how are you going to deal with that? I met a man since we've been here. This is about a month and a half ago. I had to deal with some business for the association. And I asked the guy, I said, well, where do you go to church? He said, well, I don't go, but I need to go. And then listen to what he told me. And I, I'm kind of blown away by his statement. He said, I had a, a bad divorce, and I just haven't gotten back in church. I said, well, when was your divorce? He said, 1981. Now, you're laughing at that. But I would, wouldn't doubt, brother, there's people in this room that are holding on to things from 1981. Huh. So I did tell him this because I thought I got nothing to lose. He can't go to church any less than he's going now. So I, I told him, I said, don't you think it's time to get over that and get back in church and end well? He's like 80 years of age. I'm thinking, you're 80 and you're still holding on to this? You like your misery? Here's what I've discovered with a lot of people. Their misery is the only thing in life they can control, so they hang on to it. Some people love their misery. They love complaining all the time because they never have dealt with disappointment. Listen, disappointment is not optional. Look at verse 1. The psalmist writes, Truly God is good to Israel, to such as are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled, my steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Now this is written as it says there, it's a psalm of Asaph. He's a chief psalm writer. He's basically Wayland. He's the guy that leads the music for the Jews. And so the guy who writes the songs is saying, God's good, but I am messed up. Because I looked around me and I didn't like what I saw. How would it be if the guy who led the music had a bad attitude? How would it be if the pastor had a bad attitude? How would it be if your Sunday school teacher came into class every week with a bitter, angry attitude? You see, the psalmist is saying, I believe God is good. I don't have my theology wrong. I'm just wrong. Is it possible to have right theology and still be wrong? Yeah. Folks, I, I have met some pretty bitter Baptists. I have had deacons that I've dealt with and I'm thinking, they're ordained, but are they saved? I had a deacon in your dad's church your dad and I were in. That was a tough one. I used to stand over where he sat on Sundays during the week and say, God, would you change his heart or get him out of here? One of the most bitter guys I'd ever met, but he never missed. Why is it some of the most bitter people never miss church, brother? I don't, I don't understand that. And I'll tell you what it is. It's because it's control. People want to control things without letting God control them. If we could just have revival in the church, in the lives of people that are angry and bitter about stuff, we could change our communities. Our problem is not the alcohol in our community or the fentanyl or the drugs or the gambling or all the mess on the internet. The problem's the mess in us. And preacher, if we could just change the culture, our church would do great things. If we could just change us. I tell you what we need in a lot of Baptist churches today. We need three or four people, and that's all it really takes to hold the church back, to get in front of the church and say, folks, listen, I've been in this church for 40 years, and I've been holding this back. I want to apologize for my bad attitude. If we had that all over Washita Parish, we could see revival. Here's the deal, because disappointment's not optional, but people let it eat them up. Notice what he says, I had almost stumbled I nearly slipped. Now, this is the point that you need to grab onto. 
He said, I was on the verge of going over the edge. I am the psalm writer for the Jews, but even here, I was so taken up by what I was observing around me that it was eating me up. Look at what he says in in verse 4. Talking about wicked people. For there are no pangs in their death. They don't even hurt when they die. Their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like other men. Verse 7, their eyes bulge with abundance. They have more than the heart could wish. He's saying, I see ungodly people succeeding and I'm struggling. And here's what he's really saying. It's just not fair. You ever told your kids this? It's not, life's not fair. Washington Baptist Church, life is not fair. But the joy of the Lord is still my strength. But see, this is homecoming. Shouldn't we be talking about how great the church is? Let's talk about how great the church can be. Church can be greater if we would deal with our issues. A number of years ago, he used to be in this area. Many of y'all remember Brother Bill Robertson. Uh, we had him when I pastored in Manny. He came and spoke after the Gina revival. Some of y'all might remember that back 20 years back. And, and I said, Brother, come to our church and tell us what happened. Here's what he told me. That thing went on for weeks And he said, people would come and they would leave things at the altar. They would leave at the altar things that were holding them back from God. He said, as it went on, people started giving up stuff that was holding them back. Answer this question right now. What is holding you back from God? Is there anything in your life? And the older you get, I'll tell you what I find more than anything. It's not sins I'm involved in. It's attitudes that I hold on to. It's not the stuff on the outside, it's what I possess on the inside. A pastor said years ago in a message, the number one sin in the church is bitterness. You've got to forgive some people. I did a message years ago when I was in Morgan City about the need of people in the church to forgive dead people. Is there anybody that's dead you need to forgive? Have you ever thought about going to the cemetery? looking at a headstone of somebody and and saying, look, i got to let this go. I I forgive you even though you don't deserve it. I need to forgive you anyway. You might need to forgive some people you can't even find. If we could deal with that, listen, disappointment is in the hearts of many here today. What about my grandson, Will? Let me tell you this. I, I never got mad at God in the process but I did struggle. Cried many a tear. I'll never forget this. We got back from the hospital the night the doctor said he will not survive. And I remember I was weeping that night. And I said, Tamily, I cannot see myself doing my grandson's funeral that's two weeks old. I did his funeral at 76 days. Let me tell you this, whether it's two weeks, 76 days, four years, pain is pain is pain. And you have got to deal with it. We're going to have an invitation in a few minutes. I'm going to have Brother Mike down here. There are people in this room that need to come and grab his hand. Brother Mike, I've got an issue and I want to leave it today. I want to forgive somebody today. Would you pray for me? I have had this that has been holding me back because I've let discouragement, a dis- disappointment turn into discouragement. Look at the second thing. Discouragement's a choice. Disappointment is not optional, but discouragement is a choice. You don't have to be discouraged. What do you mean by that? Well, you will have episodes of it, but you deal with it. Otherwise, discouragement that is unattended becomes your character. And you not only become a person who is discouraged, you become a person who's a discourager. Do we have people in the church that were disappointed, who became discouraged, who turned into discouragers? I'll give you an indication of that kind of person. Brother Mike, it's cold in here. Brother Mike, it's hot in here. Let me tell you what we had in in Morgan City. We We renovated the church, got a new air condition. I would have people in the church at the same time I'd have one lady with a shawl freezing to death and another lady with a fan in the same building. Brother Steve, I'm cold. Here's what I thought. Why doesn't she sit 
where the lady that's hot sits. Why don't they just swap chairs? I remember saying this from the pulpit. I thought, I said, folks, if you're cold, don't sit under the vent because the vent blows in some places and it doesn't blow in others. But that's my pew. Then deal with it. You're going to be cold or you're going to be hot. Either stay with your pew or don't complain about how hot or cold you are. Well, I'm menopausal. Sorry, I can't help that either. You don't know what you are, hot or cold. It changes from hour to hour. Listen, discouragement is a choice. I read a book years ago entitled Total Church Life. It came back in the 90s. It was written to pastors. And this quote, I've gone back and read it over and over again. Listen to what the author of this, this book says. He says, there's two responsibilities that exist when a preacher becomes discouraged. He can repent or quit. God cannot use a discouraged preacher. When discouragement comes, the preacher's finished. Listen to this statement. Discouragement is sin. It's the sin of self-centeredness. When we become discouraged, it means we have gotten our eyes upon ourselves rather than on Jesus. When discouraged, we face three alternatives. Repent of the sin of discouragement. Resign and move on or quit the ministry altogether. Keep your eyes on Jesus and you will never get disappointed or discouraged. Now, I disagree with the last statement. You will get discouraged. You just don't camp out there. Some of you have camped out in discouragement. In fact, it is you. I'm not going to ask you to raise hands, but who are the discouragers at Washita Baptist Church? They're in every church. Are you him? Are you her? Are you the minister of criticism in Washita Baptist Church? Now think about it. If, if you could even be considered that, Today, you need to deal with that. On the sign, the healing place, you can have right under it the most encouraging place in the community. Because to be a healing place, you've got to be an encouraging place. If you want to get beyond year 40 and year 41 and 42, be great and, and, and to see the church thrive. It is when people in the church deal with their hurts and they find healing and they move ahead. Notice verse 13 of our text. Surely I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocence. For all day long I've been plagued and chastened every morning. If, if I had said I will speak thus, behold, I would have un, been untrue to the generation of your children. When I thought how to understand this, it was too painful for me. He's going through this whole litany of thoughts as you, we read earlier in verses 4 through um, 7. Uh, the, the wicked are doing well. I'm, I'm not happy about it, God. And then he makes a statement in verse 13. I guess I've cleansed my heart, my heart in vain, God. I, I've got my hands washed in innocence. Uh, Father, it's in vain. I've done right, and, and yet they seem blessed more than I am. You ever look at evil people and wonder why they get away with it? And you say, God, that's just not fair. God, why do evil people's grandkids live and, and my grandchild dies? Why do evil people, they buy the new vehicles and I got laid off? Why do evil people's kids get the scholarship and my kid makes C's? God, why do evil people look pretty and I'm not happy with myself? Let me tell you right now, everything on this planet is temporary. Hello? It's all temporary. And I want, to grab, I want you to grab something. This is so important. It's a concept I learned with my grandson's death. He was supposed to die at two weeks. He lived 76 days. If you hear nothing else, hear this this morning, and this, this will help everybody in the room. Every miracle on earth is temporary. Would you hear that? There are people in this room that have been healed multiple times, and you didn't even recognize it. But yet, when you weren't healed, you pay attention to it and you get mad about it. All healings are temporary. So Elijah lived 76 days. He could have died at two weeks. I had some people say to me, well, wouldn't it have been easier on you and the family if uh, maybe he just not had been born? And my response to that is, I got two and a half months with my grandson. And that was wonderful. I'll never 
ever lose that. Now, let me tell you what that means. You can either mourn what you didn't have or celebrate what you did have. It's all about the perspective of life. And you see, that's what Asaph has to recognize. He's saying here, I wash my hands in vain all day long. I feel plagued. I'm chastened in the morning. And then verse 15, if I had said I will speak thus, behold, I would have been untrue to the generation of your children. He's making a statement there. I could have talked about my disappointment and become a sharer of discouragement. That is the potential of everyone in this church. If you do not deal with the disappointment in your life and you get deeply discouraged, then the next thing that's going to happen is you're going to discourage other people. Because you know what discouragers want? They want other people to feel like they do. Because it makes them feel better about where they are. Well, I've had 16 surgeries. How many surgeries you have? I got seven scars. You want to see them? I've been laid off four times. Let me tell you right now, we need to share God's grace rather than our grievances. I think of the story of Job. Do you know this? And this is just the way it is. The day Elijah died, I was at a DOM meeting um, at Tall Timbers Camp. And I read through the one-year Bible every year. The one-year Bible reading on August 21st, the day Elijah died, and it would happen one day a year, was Job 1 and 2. Just the way it is. <laughs> Job 1 and 2. I remember reading it that morning, not knowing he would die that day. And I remember when I turned the page, I thought, of all readings, God, I hope today in my life is not like Job's. Guess what it was? <laughs> and do you know today in your life could be like Job's too? You can get a phone call this afternoon. Here's really the question. Not that we want it to happen, but are we ready if it does happen? Because here's an incredible truth of the faith. If you will walk closely with God when things are good, then you can walk closely with God when things are bad. But if you play games with God and you're distant from God when things are good, you'll have a tough time walking close to God through the valley of the shadow of death. Because here's the fact of church, folks. There are a lot of you that are in the house of God, but many of you are far from the heart of God. The goal is not to be in the house of God. It is to be close to the heart of God, because then I will be in the house of God. Let's see the last thing today. Repentance is the solution. So I have an invitation. You mean I need to repent of my discouragement? Yes. Because as the author said a minute ago, discouragement is the sin of self-centeredness. I've made it all about me. And when it's about me, it can't be about God. And when it's about me, it can't be about Washtenaw Baptist Church. And when it's about me, it can't be about my neighbor. When it's about me, it's about my hurt and my pain and my, 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 my. Is that you? Notice what he says. This is kind of cool the way... Uh, the passage comes to the end today. Verse 16. When I thought how to understand this, he's struggling. It was too painful for me until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I understood therein. Let's translate it another way. I wasn't handling my discouragement because I wasn't in the presence of God. But when I got in the presence of God, I was able to handle my discouragement. Notice how he ends the whole chapter, verse 25. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is none upon earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart fail. They will. Folks, it's going to happen. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Here's what he says. Life's going to have failures of my flesh and of my heart. But you're the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Because we're all going to die. I loved my dad. My dad died when I was 27. We were in Iowa serving as church planners. We came back and got there within 48 hours of his death. He had lung cancer. 
I stood over my dad's bed. He was 61. I looked at him. I said, Dad, I cherish you. He was in a coma at that point. No regrets. I loved my dad. Let me tell you why my dad was so special to me. My dad was a disabled veteran. He was in the U.S. Air Force, was at Barksdale Air Force Base. He was a fireman. One day when he was on the flight line, the, one of the fire engines he was working with, uh, brakes went out, the guy swerved to miss an airplane. The fire engine ran over. My dad crushed his legs. Imagine the wheels of a fire engine going over your legs. My dad should have uh, bled out on the tarmac. He didn't. He uh, was in the hospital for the better part of a year. Wasn't even saved. Got saved after that. And from 27 when he uh, had the accident to 61 when he died, and all throughout my life, my dad wasn't mad at the government. He wasn't mad at the driver of the truck. He wasn't mad at God. My dad was a deacon. My dad was a Sunday school teacher. My dad took up the offering with his crippled body. My dad did hospital visits. My dad loved me. My dad gave me an example of reading his Bible in the house. And here's what my dad taught me. Life was unfair to my dad, but that's okay. God was good to my dad. And so I kept thinking back to my dad when we went through the story of Elijah. I could not allow that to determine my attitude. Because if I'm going to be a man of God who gets in the pulpit and preaches, I've got to trust God even when life isn't the way I want it. Here's the invitation today, folks. I'm speaking to believers in this room, and I want you to listen to me as we, we wrap this up. Answer this question. Is there a conscious or unconscious anger, disappointment in God in my life? Is there something that's happened I've not gotten over, and I have blamed God for it? I'm going to guess there's some people in this room. I've had people come up to me preaching this message. I had a lady come up to me at another church said, my mother committed suicide a couple years ago, and I've been mad at God. Today I want to get over that. I had a minister come up that's an older man. He said, I was mad at God because I felt like he put me on the shelf with health problems. I've had other people talk to me afterwards. I just needed to hear that. I'm dealing with a struggle in my life. Let me tell you right now, in your life, today's the day to deal with it. If you're lost and you don't know Jesus personally, Brother Mike will be here in a minute. I'm going to stand up here as well if you need, you need to pray. T today's the day to deal with that. Can I tell you, it's never going to get better if your heart's not right. Disappointment, discouragement, disconnection. Have you gone through that pattern in your life? Brother, if I'm in the moment of disconnection, I need to get right with God. Brother Mike, why don't you come? I'll be here. Today's a day to deal with these hurts that keep you from being what you need to be with the Lord. Let's stand together. Let me pray for our started. Father, you've spoken to hearts today, Lord. We know you gave this message to Brother Steve, Father, to speak to us today. And Lord, there may be one, there may be others that are hurting. Hurting from unforgiveness. God, whatever it may be in their life, something they've not been able to put behind them. May today be that day they're able to lay it down. Give it to you. Turn from it. Walk away from it. And get victory over it. God, there's some here today who are not saved. May they, Father, feel the desire to step out of that pew and and God, just to walk forward and say, I want Jesus. I want Jesus. For without Him, we have no hope of the future. No hope of eternity. Today, God, has your way in our prayer. Right now, we commit this invitation to you, O Lord. Do what you want to do. In Jesus' name.
Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and train them for joy. For the ashes a new life is formed. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Today is a day for freedom. Brother Steve, I, I, something's not right in me, and I have sensed it for a while. And, and today, I, I, I felt an unease in my heart. That means God is saying, you need to deal with something. I've learned over the years that if I say, no, I'll just ignore it. God may not once again remind me of it. If today you have felt an urging of your spirit, where God is saying, deal with this, why don't you come? We've had several come to the altar. We have some that have come to us to pray. Today's the day to come home. It's homecoming. Today's the day to come to Daddy. Come to the Father. Why don't you do that? Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is He's calling. calling. Don't hang on to the pew. Hang on Have to Have you come, come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Let's let today be a healing day for you. Yeah. Let this be a healing place for you. No matter what you've been through, no matter what's happened in your life, God's got healing for you today. Amen. And no matter what it is, you can share it with someone here. I know Brother Stephen and I will be available. We'll play it after the service is over. If you just want to come talk to somebody or want somebody to pray with you about something, if you need to let go. You know, I think one of the worst things we can do is let our future be held back or held down because of our past. That's right. And that's what will happen. The past will hold you down and hurt your future. We don't get it right.
you know what? We can't do it for you. You can come to us and we can counsel with you, but you're the one who has to forgive someone. You've got to let it go. You've got to lay it down. You've got to leave it. You know what it means? It means it doesn't matter anymore. That's what forgiveness is. To release something. And you're the only one who can do that. If you've got something like that in your life. So thank you for being here this morning. Thank you, Brother Steve, for the message you shared with us. I don't think it's over. I think it's going to continue on through the next day. But Amen. I think God's going to keep doing some things in people's lives. So tonight, this morning, I want you to just uh, I want you to enjoy each other's company, fellowship together over a meal. And uh, I'm so thankful to my brother Steve about how he's coming and sharing God's message. But I, I just feel like he's a real brother and I can talk to him if I need to about ministry stuff. And I'm excited about what God's going to do with he and Tammy Lady here uh, in our area. And uh, just know you have confidence in him. Uh, and he definitely wants to see us all work together. And uh, he's going to help us do that. We as churches in this association can do a lot more together and we can do separate. We want to work together to make that happen. Okay? Thank you for being here. We don't have service tonight because of this, but we do have service tomorrow night. Remember the teachers and leaders? Teachers and leaders are going to have a uh, uh, 5 o'clock meal uh, tomorrow, and he's going to speak to us at 6.30 for everyone else here in the fellowship, here in the sanctuary. And tonight, if you're interested... Uh, made a reservation for our people to go to the movie tonight to see the one about the Robertson family uh, called The Blind. Here in Tinseltown, the movie that we reserved a, a place for is at 5.30. Now, others can get in there too, so if you want to get there, make sure you get a ticket. You need to get there by 5 o'clock. You're paying for it, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not paying for that. All right. Uh, it's about $11, or maybe $11.50 per ticket. It's a little higher than normal. Come on, Eddie, you going to pray for it? Yeah, we will. And uh, so, plan to be here. Thank you. Eddie. Yes, Eddie. the Senior Adult Progressive Revival uh, starts tomorrow morning uh, at the Clinton Baptist Church. What time? 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock, and then where else? Where's the rest of the schedule for us? Tuesday is at the new First Monroe campus. Okay. And then Wednesday is at Cedar Crest. Okay. And uh, Richard Black will be speaking Monday and Tuesday, and I'll be preaching Wednesday. Okay. So you want to go Monday or Tuesday? No, I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 Thank you for being here. Brother Eddie's going to focus in prayer and pray for our meal this no, morning. No, if you no. didn't bring anything, you stay and eat anyway. No, I'm sure there's going to be plenty there. I'll wait till last, so there's not enough. I'll be the one left for that, all right? <laughs> so you come on, and uh, Brother Eddie, again, pray for our food this next door. <laughs> Thank you for being here today. Let us pray. Grace. Gracious Heavenly Father, it's just so great to be in your house this morning to hear such a message that we need to hear. Father, how many times have we heard it that we need to come to the altar and make that confession that forget the things of our past. As the pastor was talking about, we don't want to downgrade ourselves of what we have done, but what we're looking for to where we're going. Father, we ask you now just to bless the food that's been prepared for us for our homecoming. Father, we just want to thank those that's all participated in bringing the food and preparing it. There's a lot of hard work going on back there. And Father, we just want to uh, thank you for that. Father, we want to ask you again to bless our church for the next 40 years that you've given this community, that uh, the word has been spread so faithfully in our, in our community. Father, it's just so great to look out into the, to the services this morning that we had and see so many faces smiling and enjoying the word that we needed to hear so much. And Father, we just want to thank you for loving us, for being who you are. For well, it's all these things I ask in your precious, most holy name. Amen.